Check, one, two, check. Check, one, two. Check, one, two, check. Nirvana began in 1987 in Aberdeen. Uh, essentially, Chris Novoselic and Kurt Cobain got together. They had uh, six different drummers over the years. It wasn't until 1990 that they got Dave Grohl. Um, early on, they were really very much more a punk band. By about 89, Cobain, though, was writing a few more melodic songs. So they played for probably about three or four years locally before they got really any national attention. And uh, by the fall of 91, when the Nevermind came out in September of that year, they became an international sensation. He was goofy, you know, and you could, you could talk to him, you know? I mean, he always had time to talk to you. He was a real polite, nice kid, and uh, nobody that you had ever thought would make it. It wasn't what all that was cracked up to be. It wasn't what he thought. And it didn't fix whatever he wanted to fix in his life. They got famous too fast, you know. They went from just garage band to number one, you know. That was just too much put on him. They accomplished a lot more than they set out to do in a short amount of time. I wonder what he'd been like, you know, in his 40s. It probably affected his character a little bit in so much that he came from a small, smaller town. He wasn't from a big city. He wasn't from Seattle, Los Angeles. He grew up in Aberdeen. And I think living in a smaller community certainly shapes, in a way, who you become as an adult. I think you really, you know, do grow up a little bit differently. It's a small, insular, uh, blue-collar town. It feels far away. I mean, you're out near the water. Um, sometimes it seems very far away from Seattle. It's a depressed timber town. You know, there's no, there's no getting around that. And a lot of his inspiration, good or bad, came from right around here in Aberdeen. And you know, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stories of, you know, things that supposedly happened to him or he did or didn't do. And a lot of it's exaggerated. But you know, basically, for those that you know, hammer on Aberdeen now, they need to remember that that, that angst and that attitude that he got was basically because of his upbringing here in Aberdeen. There is a lot of Aberdeen in the music that Kurt Cobain produced in his short time that he was alive. Growing up then was, you know, a lot of, a lot of layoff news, a lot of mills shutting down, uh, a lot of alcoholism, things like that, you know, depressing parts. And this is not the best weather area in the world as far as rain and gray clouds, which kind of adds to the bleakness of the area sometimes. Kurt grew up in what you have to describe as a pretty dysfunctional household. Of course, that description holds for a lot of homes uh, in the world. Um, but his parents divorced when he was a teenager, and that really greatly affected him. I read mainly images of Kurt when we were little kids. I just remember him riding his bike up and down the street and stuff, because he was a couple years older than me, so we never really played. But I was a little bit more with his sister, Kim, and so that's how I kind of knew him. She used to always say that whenever we were over at her house and up in her bedroom or playing around that, you better, oh, better leave for my brother gets home, he'll beat you up. So, <laughs> so a couple of times we had to jump off the, <laughs> off her, out of her window when he'd get home, but uh, never happened, never. <laughs> yeah, he was a really good kid. He, uh, he really loved his dad and mother uh, up until the time they divorced, and then, it, and then he sort of went haywire. I think it hurt him because uh, his dad and mother didn't pay that much attention to him after that. So he just sort of crawled in his own shell. Just before they divorced, well, Kurt come down to Arizona. Iris and I was living in Arizona six months out of the year in uh, Yuma. And uh, we stopped at uh, Disneyland. And when we was there, they had a ride. And uh, they got a a board hanging there. If your head touches the board, uh, you can ride on it. If it don't, well, uh, you can't ride on it by yourself. And uh, so Kurt, he touched the board and he got on it. And so Iris and I went down where the exit was. And uh, when he got off of that ride, his, his face was just pure white. He just turned white from it. 
And I looked at him, I says, you want to go again, Kurt? And he says, yeah. And boy, the old blood just rushed back to his face. He right, the normal color. We were sure glad he fell asleep when we went by Magic Mountain. <laughs> We'd have had to stop and go there. He had us tired out. I think as a teenager, Kurt Cobain struggled just as every teenager struggles with uh, identity, with family issues, with sexuality, with uh, the issues of what was he going to do in his life. In addition to the normal teenage angst, you know, Cobain also most likely suffered from depression. I mean, that seemed to be something that he was never properly diagnosed as that, but that was something that throughout his life really marked his existence. The divorce between his parents was like a pivotal thing that I, from what I can see, and he never got over it. So then he needed a place to stay, and so Jesse, my son, wanted him to come stay out at our house. He stayed with us for about a year, and he was really quiet, and he didn't seem to have a lot of ambition. I remember driving him to a, to a, a restaurant in uh, Grayland where he worked washing dishes. He hated it, but he you know, was like needing the money, wanting the money, but he hated that kind of work. He just hated it. He was a square peg in a round hole right from the, from the get-go. Uh, he was into art, and he was into music, but the music was... You know, it was more like the punk stuff, but not really. We always thought he'd be a drummer because uh, he'd always, every time he'd come over, he'd get a couple sticks, kindling sticks, and he'd be on our pots and pans. He's always playing on them. And then uh, his uncle had a band, or he was in a band. I don't know whether it was his or not. And uh, Kurt used to go play the drums and that. He was, he was pretty talented. His uncle was my drummer and uh, we used to practice at his house and Kurt was uh, staying there at the time that's when his folks were breaking up go getting through the divorce deal and so Chuck asked me if uh, I would give Kurt guitar lessons if he paid for them and I said yeah and so uh, comes in with this total piece of junk unplayable unfixable guitar right and uh, so I, I got him another guitar asked him what his goal would be to learn and uh, he told me Stairway to Heaven I told him to put it on a cassette tape. This was back, back in 80 or 81, I can't remember exactly. And uh, he brought it in, and I remember he had that on there, and School's Out for Summer, and um, I Like to Rock, and a few songs like that, and something by ELO. And uh, so Stairway to Heaven, you don't learn it the first month, you know. usually takes a little while. And uh, he was just just uh, kind of getting into it about when he quit and it was, seemed like it was about three months that he took lessons for. Why did he, why did he stop after a while? Oh, he wasn't doing his homework anymore. <laughs> All he was doing was playing guitar. I remember I used to always tell him, be original. Anybody can copy somebody else, right? Be original. And then when we were working on songwriting, that's what I told him. I said, if you're going to make it, you got to be something different. <laughs> A lot of those odd chord progressions, I think he did just to be different. That This is different because these chords don't go together, right? And I had an old bass amp. When he found out about that, he wanted to, I had it in an old room that wasn't even heated, so he wheeled it out into the bedroom that Jesse and him were in, and he would hook his fuzz to one his guitar, and he had just a standard, regular, cheap old guitar wired backwards so he could play left-handed, and he would just, go up there hours just with that fuzz tone and ja, 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 ja. B.B. King was on the TV and I got a hold of Kurt and Jesse, come on down here, there's a guitar player I want you to hear. He watched him for about 30 seconds, scoffed and said, that guy doesn't show me anything. And I thought, whoa, you know. Kurt was a very intense person. Um, I've had like a few friends that sort of had personalities like that. Um, he was extremely driven. He knew exactly what he wanted and he had like big plans on how to get there. And I think that a lot of people in our crowd were that way. Um, basically, we all thought we were going to take over the world and change the world, you know. And actually, I was kind of surprised when it actually happened. But um, sort of like the people that had been kicked around in high school, like finally got a voice and became popular. He didn't think too, um, too highly of himself. And um, he was like, he didn't like life. He just didn't like life. You know, he was like, he. He used to write shit on his t-shirt, like, you know, I wish I were dead, or I want to kill myself. 
and stuff. And I'm like, dude, what's, what's your malfunction? <laughs> what's with that shit? You know? And he goes, it's just how I was feeling at the time. And I had talks, a couple of talks with his mom, and I was trying to help him out do the quote unquote Christian thing, but he really wasn't having much of, of it. There was no lines of communication at all. He wanted to be a rock star or be something. He wanted to put his mark, you know. It's kind of raw sound, and he had a naivety about just really not knowing music theory and what went together. That's what I told him, just make it different, you know, do something different. And that's why you listen to his songs and he's got these odd chord progressions, you know, it's just like he takes stuff that he knows doesn't go together. Oh yeah, this sounds pretty bad, I'll use this, right? There was some actually some bluesy soul kind of a feel to it. Uh, which I was kind of glad to hear and think, well, maybe he finally got it. You know, from my standpoint, from my little limited thing, I'm thinking, well, you know, that's kind of bluesy and that's kind of, that's kind of cool. And, uh, but some of the other stuff, it didn't, it, it just was lost on me. And I just counted it off as the, the angst, the, the angry teenage, you know, stuff. Kurt stuff wasn't anything you'd whistle in the shower, you know. And it, <laughs> He kept telling me in the late 80s that Kurt was going to be this big star. And to me, it, it just wasn't going to happen. If there was someone voted most likely not to succeed, it was him. We all called ourselves punk rockers in those days, and, and Nirvana considered themselves a punk band. We were all kind of part of this artist's poet scene in Seattle and Olympia, and we all hung out with a lot of people that were doing like art and consider themselves artists. And um, so I just thought, you know, it was part of the same thing. Nirvana didn't stand out from the rest of people. I thought everyone was very talented and very interesting in that whole scene. And there was a lot of really smart people, some of whom didn't go to college. And uh, I made friends with Tracy Miranda. And she was dating a boy named Kurt who was in a band called Modest Mouse. And then after I moved back to Seattle, she broke up with that Kurt and uh, started dating a different Kurt from Aberdeen. And so eventually I met him and he turned out to be Kurt Cobain. About a Girl is a song that Kurt wrote about Tracy and um, it's kind of really revealing in certain ways um, because it's like, I can't see you every night, I've got to be free. You know, because Tracy was like the total loving woman that like totally took care of him and like was always there for him. She's like one of the sweetest people ever. Kurt and Tracy lived in an apartment on Pear Street. It's like a little house with like three apartments in it. And Tracy has a lot of animals, like she collects a lot of animals. And it was sort of Kurt's job to stay home and take care of the animals. I really believe that Kurt would have never gotten where he was if he hadn't hooked up with Tracy because basically she worked for two years and let him sit there and write all those songs like on Nevermind and um, Bleach that he wrote when he was with her. I think, I think maybe 90% of them he wrote while he was with her. The first time I really actually remember meeting him was um, when I got hired to photograph their first single cover for Sub Pop. And that single is called Love Buzz or Big Cheese is on the other side. And um, that was right um, after I'd finished college. Um, Bruce Pavitt, one of the owners of Sub Pop, had also gone to Evergreen State College a few years before me. And um, we used to have a student club where um, bands played, like the Melvins were our house band there. And we had hired Bruce Pavitt to come down and DJ for some dance parties. And so that's how I got to know Bruce. And so Bruce and Jonathan started Sub Pop in 1988. And basically they had like two photographers then, Charles Peterson and me. And so they gave Charles, they thought he was full time and had been a professional photographer. And I wasn't at that point because I'd just gotten out of college, but I'd been dabbling in it. And um, they gave Charles all the bands they thought would get famous, like Mud Honey and Soundgarden. And then they gave me Nirvana because they didn't think much of them at first. They were just playing around the local circuit. You know, they did the LP for the local label. And when Geffen signed them, I mean, it's quite famously now, they were expecting to sell, you know, 
quarter of a million copies tops worldwide. I mean, they did not think anything was going to happen to this band. And I don't believe the band really expected anything to happen. You know, they were just happy to be making records and playing gigs. There was nothing there that gave any hint as to what they would become. It was very competent, Pacific Northwest, you know, 1989, 1990, guitar music. It's where he built up his following was just sheer, crossing that, you know, just hitting them places over and over again and doing what he did and kind of making it up, I guess, as he went along. When I read about the way they went on tour for like a hundred bucks a night and, you know, two, two corn dogs a piece and the rest goes on the gas, and I never had that kind of determination, never. I had a friend of mine who said, hell, oh, one-year-old students is making the big time. That's when they're just kind of on the top of the college circuit. And I said, who is it? And he said, Chris Novoselic. And I said, oh, yeah, I remember him. And, uh, Chris and his brother used to come in, Robert, and each one would come every other week. First, Chris wanted to learn this heavy metal song, right? I forgot what it was. And the bass part was just like one note, you know, da 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 da, -da forever. And then do do do, and he goes, that all there is? It's, yeah. He <laughs> said, well, let's try something else. I said, well, try learning some blues, right? They got some interesting blues lines. That's where rock and roll comes from, right? From blues. But then he just got hooked on blues. That's all he wanted to learn. I think Nova Selic's role many times is sort of underplayed. Not only was he a great bass player, but he arguably was sort of the gel that kept the band together. I mean, Kurt was a pretty fragile personality. Early in their career, many people thought Chris was the band's manager. I mean, he handled a lot of their affairs and really was the sort of spokesperson of the band during, during their life. Bands need to form first and foremost around friendship. And he and Kurt had been friends for a very long time. And they brought out sides of one another's character that, again, was in an integral part of Nirvana. I mean, you notice that in the entire history of Nirvana, they got through spinal taps worth of drummers. Um, but Chris was always there. And I don't think Kurt would have been comfortable working without him. Chris and Kurt and Tad and Tracy came up in their old white van and I lived in an artist co-op and they came there to visit me and then they picked me up and we drove back to Tacoma to shoot pictures next to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. Um, and this photo is like one of the ones um, of Kurt next to the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. I don't know, Kurt, he was really young and sweet and um, didn't really do drugs. I think we smoked a little bit of pot and maybe drank a beer or something like that. It wasn't like anything serious. And um, had a real good time and uh, both of the pictures are on the front and the back of the Love Buzz CD. And I think now it's a big collector's item. I think actually the CD is worth more than what he paid me for it. The next time, I, pro I think I went to see them like a lot of times and played, but I often didn't take my camera. As a live band, they were great. I mean, they knew what they were doing. They had a dynamic. They knew how to pace a set and they knew to put the you know to intersperse the not so good songs with the good songs so there was always a high just around the corner Cobain was great I mean yeah you know, he, he was very easy to watch he but he didn't really do anything he stood there he sang his songs he played his guitar he didn't have sort of an incredible magnetism that just sort of drew everybody to the stage but very few performers do well, at the Hub Ballroom show, it was kind of interesting because there were so very few people there. There was only a small handful of people, and um, Tracy was also taking photos, and then Charles Peterson, our other friend, was taking photos. And so basically there were three photographers and practically no one in the audience. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was pretty funny. I think there's like a lot more photos than there are people in the audience then. I think it was mainly just their girlfriends and maybe one or two other friends that were there. It was almost practically empty. And so they were getting ready um, to put out their first album. And so they had me come out and shoot some pictures live at that show. And then they met me, I think it was the next day or a few days later, maybe the week after, um, at my um, studio in Belltown. And then we went for a walk around Belltown and shot a bunch of pictures that were supposed to be for their album cover. 
Um, as it turned out, Kurt had really bad acne the day we shot the pictures, and um, since none of us really knew what we were doing yet, we didn't really know how to cover it up, and so um, he ended up really hating the pictures, so they ended up running one of Tracy's live photos on the Bleach cover. You know, the, the first album, Bleach, has a couple of songs on it that I think were really breakthroughs. One was about a girl, a song that he said he wrote after listening to the Beatles all day, and you really get a sense with that song that Cobain was affected by the pop melody of the Beatles and some of the other other, uh, you know, 60s invasion British groups. Uh, then in 1990, he writes a song called Sliver, which I argue in my book is really kind of the breakthrough song for him. It's the first song where he's able to mine his own family life for, for his material. And uh, I think it's the first great Nirvana song. I think it's somewhat of a trap to analyze Kurt's lyrics too closely. He even writes something in his journals about how his lyrics are a pile of contradictions and don't take them too seriously. At the same point, though, there are things in his lyrics that are very self-relevatory, that are, that are very much about him or his family. So it's tricky. I mean, as a biographer, it's my goal to somewhat explain his songs, but at the same point, I think you can only take that so far. Uh, you know, all the words to Kurt, you know, sort of fit with the music. They, he wasn't writing poetry, he was writing songs. There was just a sense in the in the specialist music press that there was suddenly a bunch of new bands just on the club circuit. Nirvana were one, the Smashing Pumpkins were one, Mud Honey were one, that were offering some kind of alternative. It wasn't a return to punk rock basics. It was more a return to bar band basics. But for, you know, there's an entire generation that had not really seen competent bar bands around because everybody wanted to be Bruce Springsteen or Phil Collins or Guns N' Roses. There was a move away from sort of the plastic bands and the plastic music of the 1980s to a very introspective, very personal, very um, confessional uh, approach to songwriting. So whether it was confessional for Kurt Cobain himself or confessional for the generation, I think is probably a matter of opinion. I think when we look at the band in retrospect, everyone thinks that the band was amazingly successful from the beginning, and that's certainly not the case. They actually had done on five tours of the U.S. before Nevermind broke. Um, they played a number of shows where there were two or three people, 20 people, then later 50 people, then later 200 people, and finally they broke through. And pretty much the middle of 1990, they became a pretty successful touring band. All of a sudden, they were huge. You know, and this was before Nevermind came out. Um, but I guess Bleach had gotten pretty popular, especially locally. And um, compared to like the shows like a year before where there was like I say maybe 20 people or less at the show, like this time the hall was big and it was completely packed. And there was kids stage diving and it was like wild. And then Dylan, Kurt's like really close friend, came and got me in the audience and, and gave me his backstage pass because that was the first time you actually needed a pass to get backstage before you could just walk back there like it wasn't a big deal. And then when Kurt came out, he said, save some pictures for the end, I'm gonna do something fun. And um, as it turned out, he smashed his guitar. That was like the first time he smashed his guitar and stuff. But um, eventually, like he kept on smashing it and gluing it back together for every show and stuff. This one is Motorsports Garage. And uh, what's so cool about that picture was I was standing on the side of the stage and like I didn't know what to expect, but all of a sudden there was like maybe five other photographers crammed in to the little space in the back of the stage. And I was leaving my shutter open for a couple of seconds, and what's so cool is the guy's flash next to me went off. So my flash is one person, and then the other person is his flash. And then years later, I actually found the photo he was taking in a picture book from England, and so I thought it was so funny, because it's the same, but it's from a little different angle or something, so I don't know. I just thought that was humorous, a weird accident, but a good one. And actually, a lot of people say that that's their, one of their favorite photos of Kurt, because he looks kind of haunted a little bit. But again, I still think that was before the drugs and everything. I mean, there was so much uh, rumor. It was hard, you know, you'd get all these reports uh, through news, through magazines, on the street, and I think, you know, there was uh, certainly taking a lot of these accounts with a grain of salt. Like, it's dope. I think that was just publicity for, for publicity. I don't think he was as bad as uh, what they say. I know his mother said he wasn't on dope. Oh, well, drugs have been in, always been in music. You know, obviously it didn't help anybody out. And uh, I don't know 
with Kurt's stomach trouble may have even got him into drugs in the first place. Could be ulcers, could have been diet, um, could have been irritable bowel syndrome. No one ever quite got a handle on it. But uh, those chronic, you know, gastrointestinal issues also affected him and I think added to his depression. He hated eating. He would be, I mean, he'd be sitting at the, at the table and he'd be crying, tears running down his eyes, you know, because, you know, because he's, you know, his stomach is so upset. And what was sad about it, heroin um, helped him deal with the, uh, you know, the stomach pain. I think it made him completely hopeless. I think heroin kind of ruins lives and makes people completely hopeless. And I believe that he would still be here with us if he hadn't started getting into heroin. Drugs were not something that incapacitated him. He still was able to write songs and put on concerts. And um, I, in some ways, I think you know his drug addiction, we focus so much on because of his death. If he would have gotten better and lived, we wouldn't look at it as such a darkness. Tracy doesn't do drugs, and she never has. And I think his life got very chaotic after he broke up with her. And uh, I know that um, she moved out of the apartment they'd been sharing in Olympia, and then they went on tour, and they ended up losing their apartment while they were on tour. They didn't pay the rent. Dave Grohl um, became the drummer in the band um, after Bleach. Uh, first they had Chad Channing. Then they had Danny Peters, who was later in Mud Honey and a few other bands around here. Um, but they only had him for like part of one tour, and then they got um, Dave Grohl. I do think at times that Chad Channing gets sort of downplayed. Chad was a great drummer for the jazzy or punker side of Nirvana. Um, Grohl was fantastic when it came to these powerhouse anthems. He could hit really, really hard, and that was a benefit. Drummers are different. You know, they grow up liking to hit things. <laughs> You know, I mean, they say, the old adage is, they say, what makes a, a rock and roll band? What's a three-piece rock and roll band? Two musicians and a drummer. <laughs> but they had trouble filling that bill, because I think, because Kurt had a, an ear or a sound that he had in his mind, and the others couldn't, couldn't deal with it. And he got it. He got it to a degree, or to the degree that he wanted to, because it became very popular. And he... He identified, or a lot of people identified with what he, what he had going on. You know, I think like any band playing around uh, Seattle at the beginning, you know, you're going, you're on the club circuit in town. And, um, but I think unlike most bands, they didn't have as much of a struggle. They had Bleach come out, and that did come out to critical acclaim, even though it wasn't necessarily widespread. Uh, it wasn't heard by you know millions of people but then they turned around and released Nevermind. Nevermind came out and of course Smells Like Teen Spirit was that record did not have a right to exist in a way it was so perfect. You listen to the first 30 seconds of it and you go my god you're blown away by it even before Kurt begins to sing. At the time I was reading a book called Silence by John Cage who said it's the silence in between the notes that gives them their power right and I told that to Kurt and when I first heard uh, Teen Spirit, <laughs> there it is, you know, how he, and then down that real quiet, you know. So I thought, ah, he remembered. I worked at a rock station in town called KDUX where we were playing uh, basically your album oriented rock. <clears throat> and the single came in, and I was one of the first people, because I was the music director at the time, and I got the single and listened to it. I thought, wow, this is hot. And uh, these guys are out of Seattle. And then uh, another guy that worked there, Pat Anderson. He was doing weekends at the time, but his older brother was a little older than us and was new Kurt in high school. He said, you know, that's Kurt Cobain in that band. And I go, no way. And so I said, that, that is cool. So I said, we got to be playing this. What was it about Smells Like Teen Spirit that made it an anthem? I'm, who knows? And if you actually sort of take the song to pieces, it's Boston's More Than a Feeling with a different verse. And yeah, that shouldn't really be the recipe for success. It's almost undefinable to, to really talk about what makes that a great song. Just an anthem for a generation. Sadly, I think in a way almost everything else they did, no matter how good, paled because there was no song more perfect in every way, shape and form than Smells Like Teen Spirit. I think you could pull off any of the singles. The singles from that album were very well chosen. They picked the ones that actually had 
a memorable hook. Not necessarily a tune, but they had a hook. Sometimes I'd think he'd be saying one thing and it would really be something else, so I'd never found out till I looked at them years later. I think some of the songs I knew were about friends of mine. Like, I know that um, About a Girl on the first record is about Tracy. Um, and I know that, um, oh, I can't think of the name of it, is about D Dylan. Um, about the boy who shoots his gun and he don't know what it means. And I had so many complicated things. You know, a Freudian analyst could go crazy analyzing any single song. I, I, I prefer to sort of let their meanings speak for themselves because I think everybody's got a different approach. I think that's one of the powers of Nirvana, is that when people hear Kurt's music, um, it's very emotional, but many people have different interpretations. Um, you know, it can mean something very different to another person. You look at a song like Polly, which is a horror story written from the point of view of a rapist, and yet it's almost got a sympathetic view and it's got a catchy sing-along chorus. These are some crazy contradictions that were really part of Kurt's great game. At the end of the day, it certainly created a ripple. It got response. It you know, really divided all the lines between people who loved it and people who thought it was, was you know, offensive. Um, and I respect that. I think Cobain had an innate power to take these deep songs with very powerful and emotive lyrics and sort of put those juxtaposed with these poppy, loud, songs and the combination of that of kind of both having this melody but also this edge to it was really what made the band special. I reviewed Nevermind when it came out and then interviewed the band shortly after. They were delightful. It's strange because as Kurt became more and more famous and developed a public persona I didn't really see any of that in him. He he was just like a, a regular guy. And it was interesting to watch this monster develop out of the Cobain persona that really wasn't there, but it did keep the media happy. At the heart of, I think, of who he was and certainly at the heart of Nirvana and who they were, they weren't this incredible superstar mega machine. They were a band from a small city. Uh, so I think probably as things really rolled, you know, and, and you move out of music magazines and into tabloid television and tabloid journalism, um, probably is less equipped to deal with that kind of scrutiny. I don't think really that anybody in that band expected to find themselves under that lens. Jesse called me and was telling me stuff about the crowds were just freaking out and going this, they were just, and that was down in, on the beach or something. He says, man, th Dad, it was really, they had this huge marsh pit, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, can't be, you know, it can't be. I just, you know, I'd be like saying, you know, the, the janitor that's 63 years old down, that works at the school janitor, all of a sudden became a big star or became the president of the United States. It, it to me, was comparable because it just, <laughs> it, it wasn't predictable as far as I was concerned. And then when I saw it on, uh, on the music channels, you know, and it was all over the place, and the, the buzz clips and stuff, I'm going, whoa. And now for all your lawn care needs, it's Nirvana! I think he underrated himself as a musician. I think he was a lot better guitarist than, 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 than sort of he wanted to admit. Um, yes, his stuff is pretty crude, and yes, most, you know, junior guitar players can play a lot of the same stuff Kurt did but wasn't the technical prowess of how he played the stuff, it was that he could create such interesting music. They weren't really a jam band with long solos, right? They were more, they were songs, little, little songs like, like Beatles had songs, right? Beginning, middle, and end, you know, it's a song. Kurt was a good writer. He had interesting lyrics. He had a good voice, you know? He had a good, that screaming, you know, that good kind of sound, and uh, liked it, people just, he just hit it. In concert, he was a pretty decent guitarist. I mean, Nirvana were a three-piece for most of their career. They put a lot of sound out for a three-piece band, and uh, I think they were quite a remarkable band live. Fame was too fast, you know. They went from just garage band to number one, and you know, that's a big, you know, that was just too much put on him, and that's what freaked him out, I think, and that's what drove him into, you know, to the his demise or whatever.
Well, the interview got off to a fascinating start in that th you know, met up, um, went to this restaurant, we all ordered dinner, and then Kurt announced he had to uh, run out for five minutes. And uh, he didn't turn up again for like another 45 minutes, um, during which time Chris got very fed up and went home. And Dave and I were sitting around talking about antique clocks, if I remember correctly. Kurt finally sort of returns, you know, hi everybody, how's it going? And it's like, where did you go? He said, oh, I had to go and see my chiropractor. And um, maybe he did. <laughs> he did more drugs after uh, Nevermind came out because he was being comped, you know. And that was one of the kudos of uh, being Kurt Cobain. You got your drugs uh, plentiful, you know. Then he got hooked up with uh, Courtney. <laughs> it kind of cuts both ways with Courtney because Courtney is a very intelligent, highly creative, interesting person, but she's also a really big liar and kind of really vindictive and really jealous and you know so it's kind of like good or bad and you can't really tell which it's going to be. One of their friends described them to me as two players in a play and it's like they switched parts you know one day Kurt would be this role and the next day Courtney would. In general I think Courtney is sort of overplayed as, as, as sort of a villain in Kurt's life. Most of Kurt's problems were self-created. There were a number of times with Kurt's drug issues where Courtney was actually more sober than Kurt. So Courtney's such a complicated character in this picture. To try to, you know, portray her, you know, either way is almost too simplistic. This was a very complicated relationship between two creative individuals who were both very complicated themselves. There's been some pretty extreme things written about us, especially my wife, and she thinks everybody hates her now. So, um... This is being recorded, so why don't you give her a message and say, Courtney, we love you. Okay, ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. Okay. Thanks. He loved her. I mean, that was very clear to me from reading his journals and lyrics. And whether she was good or bad for him ultimately almost doesn't matter. I mean, she was who he married and the woman that he spent his last three years with. The media wanted to make a monster out of Cobain, and they were going to do it whoever he was with, and you know, however they behaved. So I think Courtney was strong enough, she was able to protect him somewhat. Cobain in particular was uncomfortable with and resented the fact that you know, he thought the biggest he was ever going to get would be the cover of Spin, for instance. And suddenly, you know, he's in the National Enquirer. And it's like, where did that come from? I'm like... Didn't you know this is what happens when you become a rock star? You, you know? He goes, I didn't want to be a rock star. I just want to play my music. Things were completely different then. He had handlers. There were, like, people that were around him that were trying to, like, control him and stuff. And. Like, I saw people, like, basically, they were, like, they're, the handlers around him, their attitude was, oh, what does the big baby want now? You know, and so they were kind of treating him, like, in this really weird thing. And it, I think it made him really uncomfortable. And um, I think he was also a little bit uncomfortable with fame because later on, um, I got a ride up to their hotel with them, with Kurt, and, like, we rode in this limousine, like, the only time I've ever ridden in a limousine. And he was, like, really apologetic about the limousine, like, oh, normally we don't take a limo. Because I think a lot of people had given him a hard time about being so bourgeois, like suddenly since they'd gotten rich and stuff. Of course, you've got the, you know, all that pressure of the first album and, and all this emotional energy and whatever. You record it all and you're kind of empty for a while and you're very satisfied or satiated by it. And then you've got to come up with something better and not just the same. You've got to go, you know, but the fans want more. In Utero was not a better album than Nevermind simply because it couldn't be, it wasn't allowed to be. 
the weight of expectation and anticipation that went into that album, well, was behind that album, well, was behind that album, there's no way they could have followed it up. The problem that any band has, you, know, you do a career-defining moment. So what do you do next? You redefine the career? I think In Utero is Nirvana's best album. It, Kurt liked it best, N Nova Selwich liked it best. I think it really was a record where, where they were able, to, as a band, to kind of stretch out. Cobain's songwriting grew. I mean, you listen to songs like Heart Shaped Box and Penny Royal T, both of whom Kurt had written quite a bit of, done quite a bit of work on those songs earlier, you know, around the Nevermind era. But those are just tremendous songs. They show a depth and a maturity that the songs on Nevermind I think he'd been happier if everybody continued to hate him. Because I remember on a MTV interview or something, he was talking about the next album and he's probably going to make some enemies out of his fans and stuff. So he had that kind of a thing where he wanted to do that. You know, he wanted to throw out the, the herring or, or something, or, or really mess with people and not give them what was predictable. I think when I first heard the song Rape Me, it was a little bit shocking because, you know, even in that point, like, people didn't really use the word rape on television. The Kurt was always really political, and he hung out with a lot of um, young feminists, including myself. And so I think that was almost like a feminist anthem for him. It really upset him when all the people that used to beat him up in high school got into his music. So he wanted to make it obscure again. I think he was torn, um, and he wanted success, but in utero didn't sell as well as Nevermind, and that was a disappointment to Kurt. Um, where they would have gone after that, who knows? Uh, you know, obviously there was a huge market still. They were one of the most popular bands in the world. Kurt was so far ahead of his time that it's very hard to even predict where he would have gone. I don't know if you guys heard, but this isn't our last show, so whoever's been telling you guys this is. I would like to officially, publicly announce that this is our last show. Or today. Until we play again um, uh, on the November 2. It was such sacrifice. Snow, self, such. He'll do. It's so. I can't say it's too painful. This is too painful. With the support of his friends and family, he's going to make it. I got a, um, a phone call and um, the caller was, you know, Definitely loaded, and I figured it was Kurt. Then um, figured out it was uh, another musician friend of mine calling me um, to tell me Kurt had killed himself. We was here at the house, and the phone rang, and uh, it was windy, 
uh, column uh, stating that Kurt had uh, committed suicide. My, actually, my dad called me up and said, did you hear about Kurt Cobain? And I said, no, what happened? He said, well, he just killed himself. I said, oh my God, and turned the news on. And it was just all over the news all day long. And it was just really, I remember just everybody was just down in the, they were just down about it because it was real rough. And it was pouring down rain that day. It had been raining for a long time. Everybody was kind of blue because it was that part of the spring in April when it had been raining and there hadn't been any sun for a few months. And um, like I said, I just got like maybe a thousand phone calls that day. Maybe not a thousand, but like a hundred phone calls like from weird people from NBC News, like some guy named Scooter from, I'm like, who is this? I don't want to talk to anybody like that. What do I have to do with this? The Seattle paper and said, is this Warren Mason? I said, yeah. And I said, the same Warren Mason that taught Kurt Cobain? I, I said, yeah. I said, but I already gave all those interviews and I was just getting ready to hang up, right? Because I was pissed off at the media anyway. And he says, oh, you haven't heard? And I said, heard what? And he said, oh, he killed himself. And I was just like, in shock. I said, what? Killed himself? I mean, I couldn't believe it. And uh, that's how I heard. Then my phone just rang off the hook. A magazine sent me and a photographer out to the house just to, like, I don't know, see what was going on. And there's this little garden beside the house, and it was clogged with children in black. <laughs> it was a sea of black clad. You know, teenagers with candles <laughs> and news crews. It was one of the strangest things I've ever seen. I remember seeing that and jumping up and, and getting in, into my Volvo <laughs> and driving pal now to his house. We went and we got all these white lilies and we took him down to the house and we put this candle and all these flowers out there like next to the place where he committed suicide because at that point in the evening like people had realized it was him you know like during the day there was like a question as to who it was up until like mid-afternoon and then they found out it was like really him. Pulling up in front just as uh, the uh, coroner's office was bringing his body down the drive. I wanted to see his body so that I could make the connection that he was truly dead. It, it, it destroyed me because, uh, you know, I felt that uh, maybe at some point, you know, I could have been a, a better friend, you know, I could have talked to him. What could someone do to save him? They, he, Kurt went to rehab five different times. So he had doctors up the yin-yang trying to help him, but ultimately he chose not to help himself. Over the next few days, the circumstances that led up to his death you know, became clear how he'd been in the rehab center, had run away, disappeared, nobody knew where he was. Courtney was going out of her mind trying to find him. His picture was everywhere, and so it's almost like you couldn't cry for him because otherwise you'd just be crying all the time. And I think I did go around crying for like a couple of years, actually a lot. Funny the way things turn out. Uh, I think Kurt deserves credit. So I mean, he'd done it all. I spent four years writing my biography, I spent essentially 10 years writing about Nirvana. I've never seen any evidence that suggests his death was anything other than suicide. Even today, people still are not 100% certain of everything that led up to the death or of what really made him do it. How can he have that much dope in him where it says that the dope alone would have killed him? And uh, everything was laid out so nice and neat and everything like that. And uh, he couldn't even have picked that shotgun up if, if, with the amount of dope that he had in him. There's the different stories. It's just kind of which one you'd believe. And personally, I can't see him killing himself because he loved his music. You know, even though his, 
his life is I think he was just getting ready to go to a divorce and has changing his will or something I heard a bunch of stuff like that I had somebody come down from Canada and I was working one night and he come in and shoved a camera in my face and started firing questions at me and he was convinced that he was murdered it was like he had um uh, he was predisposed to believe that and I I don't I believe that he was a very unhappy person and uh, I think what happened is he once he got into this this lifestyle or this thing that it wasn't what all that was cracked up to be it wasn't what he thought and it didn't fix whatever he wanted to fix in his life there's a lot to learn from Kurt's story in some ways this is a cautionary tale be careful what you wish for Kurt Cobain's dreams were were turned into reality and yet he found that he still struggled um, many of the issues in his life and his childhood, his unresolved issues, were still present even when he was rich and famous. So money does not necessarily cure things. It certainly doesn't bring happiness, and Kurt's a great example of that. Cobain's death probably created a mythology and perhaps more of a legacy that they, than they would have had. But absolutely, I think that their contribution is without, you know, without question. Nirvana are single-handedly responsible, I think, for the whole alternative boom of the 90s and beyond. I do think they will stand the test of time. I mean, I think that 10, 20 years from now, you'll still see this as a band that, that a generation of kids, when they hit a certain age, will turn to. Because I think this was very powerful music. It's kind of almost like a guide map to adolescence. I mean, up until now, people still talk about it like it was just yesterday and, and how powerful it was. I mean, I still have a couple of uh, radio singles from when I worked in radio that I got that I keep wrapped in the cellophane from the time because I thought, oh, I'm going to hold on to this. Whenever you go through your high school years, that music is your music forever. And, and Kurt fans will be Kurt fans forever. So there's a legacy. There's a thing that they did. They accomplished a lot more than they set out to do in a short amount of time. I think as time goes by and more years pass between Kurt's death and uh, in the present, uh, people think less and less about the celebrity or the personality or the tragic circumstances of his death, and they remember more the power of those songs, those words, those melodies. I think that is the ultimate lasting legacy of Nirvana. He was a very nice little boy. Yeah, he was a really good kid. He uh, he really loved his dad and mother uh, up until the time they divorced, and then it then he sort of went haywire. I think it hurt him because uh, his dad and mother didn't pay that much attention to him after that, and I, I think it uh, it hurt him uh, a lot, and uh, so he just sort of crawled in his own shell, but he was fine with Iris and I. He's a very good boy. In fact, he come to, just before they divorced, well, Kurt come down to Arizona. Iris and I was living in Arizona six months out of the year in uh, Yuma, and uh, Kurt come down there, and then he rode home with us. It was time to come home, and he rode home with us. and. Uh, uh, we stopped at uh, uh, the different places in California and took him to them, uh, like Disneyland and Knoxbury Farm and, and Universal Studios and, uh, and the zoo. Uh, we went to all them places. And then uh, when we finished up, we went to uh, Disneyland and then went over to uh, uh, 
uh, Knoxbury Farm, and when we was there, they had a ride that goes up in the air like that there, and then down and makes a circle like that and around and out, and you're out. And uh, they got a, a board hanging there. If you can, if your head touches the board, uh, you can ride on it. If it don't, well, uh, you can't ride on it by yourself. And uh, so Kurt, he touched the board and he got on it. And so Iris and I went down where the exit was. And uh, when he got off of that ride, his his face was just pure white. He just turned white from it. And I looked at him and I says, you want to go again, Kurt? And he says, yeah. And boy, the old blood just rushed back to his face. He writes a normal color. And he would have went on it again. And then we went over to them, their electric bumper cars. And he couldn't touch his head on that. He couldn't ride in one of them. But he could ride that damn thing there uh, going up. And we finished up there. We went home, started home. And he fell asleep. We were sure glad he fell asleep when we went by Magic Mountain. <laughs> We'd have had to stop and go there. He had us tired out. I think he was, oh, God, I, he started drawing, I suppose, about the time he could hold a pen in his hand or a pencil. And uh, there's uh, this one here. He was six years old. And the way this come about was he come over to the house one day and he had a picture of Mickey Mouse that he drew. And he says, Grandpa, I said, look what I drew. And I said, you didn't draw that. I said, you traced it. And he got about half mad. And he says, I did not. He says, you give me a piece of paper. And he said, I'll show you. He said, I won't draw you. I said, I'll draw Goofy. And so he he drawed Goofy then. He was six years old when he done that. Well, this here he done in 1980. This one. That's 1980. And this one is 1980. This one here, he drew in 1980 also. And uh, this one here is on a cover of a book that uh, uh, my niece wrote, Beverly. Uh, she wrote a book about suicide and stuff. And uh, this is, uh, but and I don't think she done too damn much research on it. We always, and then on his, on his musical end of it, we always thought he'd be a drummer because uh, he'd always, every time he'd come over, he'd get a couple sticks, kindling sticks, and he'd be on our pots and pans. He's always playing on them. And then uh, his uncle, uh, Chuck uh, Freidenberg, had a band, or he was in a band. I don't know whether it was his or not. And uh, Kurt used to go play the drums in that. He, he, Played him a couple times while for the band during a rehearsal, I guess. He was he was pretty talented. This is a Christmas card he sent to Iris and I one year. Um, he's got some writing in here. He says, "Dear long lost grandparents." I miss you very much, which is no excuse for not visiting. I'm very busy living in Olympia when I'm not on tour with my band. We put out a single just recently and it has sold out already. We are recording for our debate LP this Monday, which will be released in March. In February, we are going to tour again to California then we'll be back in April, only to take a break then on the road again. I'm happier than I ever have been. It would be nice to hear from you as well. Merry Christmas. Love, Kurt. Aberdeen is uh, one of these towns that's uh, well, it's not uh, uh, who you are, it's what you are. I mean, uh, people up on the hill, uh, their kids could do no wrong. And, uh, but all the kids from South Aberdeen now, they were a bunch of hoods. I only know of one kid from South Aberdeen that uh, 
the school or uh, any of them ever recognized, and that was Tony Vastalika, and that was on account of his uh, basketball uh, feats. And so there, that's the only reason I can see that they uh, liked him. I get uh, letters from all over the world. It just uh, I got stacks of them in there. And you know, the funny part of it is the people here in Aberdeen uh, really don't want nothing to do. That's where Kurt got the redneck part. They don't want nothing to do because he was on dope. But at the same time, uh, they run Kurt down, and he was a native son here. But at the same time, what about Elvis Presley, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, uh, Judy Garland, uh, uh, all of them. Uh, they were dopers, and uh, they worshiped them, Elvis Presley, and uh, they think nothing of that, but they can't realize that, you know, that I would say that 95% of the letters that I get from around the world and from the United States uh, do not mention Kurt's drugs. It's about his music, how that music helped them uh, straighten out and straighten their days out and stuff. Uh, that's, that's what it was, that's what them letters were all about. But uh, the people here in Aberdeen just can't seem to understand that. I was really proud. I really thought that was something to have a Cobain on TV that way and known around the world. I thought that was pretty good. By the way, we got a, a committee going down in Aberdeen uh, for a, a park for him. Now, the where the city limits sign is in Aberdeen, it says, Welcome to Aberdeen. We're putting a sign down below it that says, uh, uh, come as you are, and it'd be in the same color and shape and stuff as the as the welcome sign. We're putting it there, and we're looking for a piece of land now, and uh, we're hoping for a lot of contributions. But once we find a piece of land that we can buy, then we can go to the to the for bigger contributions. You know, for uh, stuff uh, uh, to to put on, and we want to build a, a cement wall for uh, a graffiti wall, because like, have you been under the bridge up there? Yeah. All the writing that's under there? Uh, that's really neat, that's something. Uh, I get letters from, I've got some letters from uh, uh, women that were uh, about Kurt's age and uh, was following the, along, you know, following, there were fans of Nirvana and uh, uh, they got kids now, and their kids are uh, write letters uh, to me, and uh, or in I got one from uh, Sandy, Texas, and, uh, and that's a mother and daughter. I think the daughter's fourteen now. I don't know how old the mother is. Uh, I enjoy them. I mean, uh, I have probably get what three or four letters a, a week, and I answer them all. Uh, and everyone that I've ever got, a lot of them are from college kids. A lot of them are uh, people that have uh, grown up with. Uh, Kurt's music and they're married and got kids of their own now and, and uh, there's an awful lot of uh, 14 and 15 year olds that uh, write and uh, ask me questions about Kurt. I tell them whatever I know. We was here at the house and the phone rang and uh, it was Wendy uh, calling. Uh, Stating that Kurt had uh, committed suicide, and it really shocked my wife. Well, it did me too. I mean, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't think he was suicidal at all. There's just too many facts that uh, they missed. I mean, the the first thing is 
how come that shotgun was still laying on his chest? To me, I got a 12-gauge shotgun. This one is a 16 that he had. But that 12-gauge shotgun, if you don't hold it real tight to your ch shoulder, it'll knock you down from the concussion. And uh, to me, that if he had that 16-gauge in his mouth, and like I said, they were, the shot was removed from it, the, the shell, uh, the it just seemed to me it would have uh, the concussion would have blowed his eyeballs out or broke the front of his face up or something where it was fine. Uh, uh, it just it just don't make sense. And and then another thing is well, why no fingerprints on any of the shells or on the gun? No fingerprints on anything. Not even his. So. Somebody had to wipe that gun clean, and like the the second shell in the gun was a fully loaded shell. The other one was a, the first shell was a they say was a a, a burglar sh shell for intruders. He had it emptied it out and, for intruders. So it's just then nothing. Why did they cre cremate him so quick? Uh, I never heard of it going that fast. Uh, like when I went up there uh, uh, to that uh, memorial they had for him, I asked my son, Don, I says, uh, when when they going to have the funeral for him? And he got about half mad and he says, this is his funeral, he says. He's already, he said, he's already been cremated. And I, oh God, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't fathom that. Why, why so soon? unless there was something wrong. And then Courtney led that, uh, Grant uh, led him all around by his nose with uh, her stuff, uh, and uh, it was false, just carrying him away from the stuff. Uh, when I first met her, like that picture over there, uh, it's over on the counter over there, uh, I thought she was pretty nice. Uh, she said, that picture was taken sitting right over there. And uh, I thought she was nice, but then the, then when I was at the house in Seattle uh, with Kurt, uh, I didn't get to talk to her. I don't think I said, just said hi, that's about all. And then she went to town, called a limousine and went to town, and Kurt and I went out to eat then and uh, come back. And then... And then I left the next morning. They were both still in bed, and I left the next morning to pick my wife up and take her out from the hospital and take her home. And uh, that was the last time I ever seen Kerr. I think that in Seattle, he's become part of the essence of the place. He's almost like one of our icons. He's like what people think about when they think about Seattle. And uh, coffee, uh, Microsoft, and Kurt Cobain.